reading from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Understanding that this book is a prophetic book, speaking of things past, present, and future, as John was commanded to write while on the Isle of Patmos, amen, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, he was commanded of things, amen, past, present, and future, Amen, and we'll jump right into the middle of the chapter, amen, and begin with verse 7, when he recites, amen, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Say amen as you be seated. On a title of my message tonight, the devil is counting on you to fail. The devil is counting on each and every one of us, amen, all of the church, the children of God, amen, from the time that man began to call upon the name of the Lord, amen, there has been a battle in the heavens, amen, a battle, amen, in a sphere that we cannot see, a dimension that exists, amen, outside the realm of this natural, amen, that is very much real. I know that we have, as in God, have to have faith, amen, to believe in such a place, but there is another dimension. We live in a natural, physical dimension now in which we can see and we can hear and we can taste and we can feel and we know things exist, amen, by either touching or smelling, amen, or seeing the object that is before us. But there is another dimension, amen, that I believe that parallels this one of the natural, amen, that is filled with heavenly, amen, creatures and demonic forces, amen, of hell, I believe that. For the Bible says that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I believe that, don't you? I believe that there are angels innumerable, amen, cannot be numbered, I believe, in that realm and in that dimension that we cannot see, amen, exist, amen, these demonic forces, some of which fail, amen, during the time of the war, amen, that is in heaven, and therefore from that day to this, there has been a spiritual warfare, and it exists, and it is going on right now, and the prize is your very soul. You see, because there is a force out there, amen, a demonic force, amen, that wants your soul, amen, yes, he does, amen, he exists and resides in that other dimension. You cannot hear him, amen, you cannot see him, neither can you touch him, but I want you to know, amen, that he exists, he is called Satan, amen, the red dragon, amen, the devil himself, the serpent, and he exists. 
You better understand that the devil is just as real as God. He is the author, amen, of all the evil that you see in the world. He is the author of every disease and every sickness that plagues humanity. Amen. The devil is responsible for that because, amen, of his trickery. Amen. Because of his wisdom. Because of his subtlety and the ability Amen. To fool man. And that's what he did. You know the story? Without me having to go into it, how that God created Adam and Eve out of the dust of the ground. Amen. Placed them eastward in the Garden of Eden and gave him everything. And lo and behold, when Adam was created and placed there, amen, the devil was already there. And what did he do? He used his subtlety and his trickery to trick them out of eternal life. Because there's a war going on. It started then, amen, and it's still going on today. And as he tricked Adam and Eve, he's out to deceive you. The Bible says Jesus did of him in St. John 10 and 10. For the thief cometh but for naught but to kill, steal, and to destroy. I'm telling you that the devil is out to destroy you. He's out, amen, to cause you harm. He's out to bring you down. He's out to get your very soul. Why? Because the Bible says that he has but a short time. Ezekiel begins to describe him Amen. When you read the chapter of this fallen, anointed cherub, that he was wiser than Daniel. Amen. Wisdom was created in him. He was the most beautiful of creations of God. His covering was every precious stone. And in him was the tabrets. And pipes, the best music ever played, came out of him. And he was beauty defined within himself. When all of heaven gazed upon this creature, amen, this anointed cherub, they were in awe over him. For when God created him, God created him perfect when he was created. And he was filled with wisdom. And no doubt when this anointed cherub, as described in Ezekiel 28 and 14, Ezekiel said of him, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. I am made to believe that when Lucifer, amen, went about the heavens, that all heaven, amen, stopped and looked and glared at him. For he was the epitome of beauty itself. And when he began to play, there was no music like he could play. Amen. Let me tell you something. And the beauty of him, they were just in awe. Until one day, iniquity was found in him. And he... Being created perfect, filled with wisdom, the most beautiful of all creations, seen and somehow realized perhaps when he walked in through the portals of heaven 
how that Michael gazed upon him and Gabriel looked upon him and all of the angelic hosts around the throne, they gazed upon this anointed cherub. And Lucifer perhaps would walk around heaven say, look at me. There is none like unto me. Perhaps he thought in his mind, none of you exhibits the beauty that I portray. None of you. Yet there was one that was higher. Woo! And it was the Lord God of heaven. I believe that Lucifer and many believe that he held the highest position in heaven. Ruling solely under God himself. Until one day he decided that wasn't good enough. Ezekiel said of the Lord did to Ezekiel, Thou hast been in Eden. This creature was given a place where they worshiped him. He sat upon a throne. And then one day he got his eye upon the throne of God. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. And I will be like the Most High. And he led a revolt of a third part of the stars, angelic forces that followed him right into the midst of heaven, but was met there with Michael the archangel and was defeated in battle. And on that instant in time, that anointed cherub, that the beautiful of all of God's creation became something ugly and horrific. Something that was hideous. And it was sin that made him that way. Sin stripped him of his beauty. Sin stripped him of his wisdom. Sin stripped him of his knowledge. And he became and took on another role that John refers to as the accuser of the brethren. He started a war that he could not win. Now I'm telling you here tonight, amen, if you're sitting here lost in the sound of my voice, you are fighting a battle that you cannot win. You are living a life of a loser. You better hear me. I told him in Sunday school this morning how that the Bible says, the psalmist said, Thou fool has said in his heart, There is no God. And for a man or a woman to say that there is no God is indeed a fool. But I went on to say this. You know what a greater fool is? It's somebody that believes in God that won't serve him. Somebody that acknowledges the existence of God, amen, in that place called hell, yet they will not, and they refuse to bow down to worship Him. They are the greater fool. My message tonight, the devil is counting on you to fail. He has power. He is still intelligent. He is subtile, he is full of trickery, and he is the cause of many that has died and gone straight to hell. But I want you to understand, he has no power over you. Only what you will allow him to have. Ain't that the truth? How many glad that it's that way? Amen. But Simon Peter in his writing, in 1 Peter 5 and 8, I believe it is, he warns us of this fallen cherub, this serpent, this devil, this hideous creature, the author of sin. Simon Peter said to the church, 
You better be sober. You better be vigilant, which means to watch, because the devil will steal your very soul. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, the same one that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 28, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Right now, demonic forces within that other dimension are tracking your every move. Saint or sinner, hell is on your trail. Lucifer, made in charge of the wicked realm of hell, and all of those, amen, demonic spirits who are at his bidding is sent forth into the world to kill and to steal and to destroy. And I'm telling you that he's doing such a good job that hell has enlarged itself for the multitude of peoples that will enter in thereat. You better listen to me. There are going to be far more people go to hell than there ever will be that will go to heaven. You've heard me make this statement before. I've never read anywhere where heaven has enlarged itself, but hell has expanded the borders of hell, making room, amen, for people that refuse, that refuse salvation and to call upon their God. Satan, Satan has got people in the palm of his hand and he's not satisfied because he wants you. He wants God's prize possession. How many knows what God's prize possession? See, sinner people, he's already got you. He owns you. You are his. <laughs> he don't have to do anything to get you. He already has you. Uh, but he's after now God's prize possession. What is the apple of God's eye? The church. The people of God in this year that's about ready to end, 2015, that somehow through all of the troubles, through all of the trials, through all of the sicknesses and affliction, somehow out of it all they have managed to bring themselves out to the house of God. That, and you are the apple of his eye. And don't let no devil ever tell you that God don't appreciate what you're doing. Amen. And the songs that you sing and the music that you play and every time you clap your hands and stomp your feet in the house of God, I'm telling you, amen, that heaven is rejoicing because of the apple of his eye. I refuse to let the devil make me feel like I'm nothing. I'm not going to allow the devil to make me feel like I'm nothing. Amen. I'm telling you that heaven rejoices over the apple of his eye. Amen. You folk, you, amen, that don't have a lot of silver and gold, amen, or worldly possessions, but you have a love in your heart for the Lord. And that means more to Him than anything. That you, and many of you sitting here right now, no doubt don't even feel like sitting in these seats. Amen. With the sicknesses that's in your body. Yet, through faith, you're out here in the house of the Lord. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that you make heaven smile. Amen. Every time you come up those steps or any other apostolic man or woman enters into any other apostolic church, heaven rejoices and heaven smiles. You know why? Because unless you fail, the devil cannot win. 
How many understand that? The only way that the devil can win is if you fail. And I've got good news for you tonight. Amen. As the apple of his eye, we do not have to fail. Amen. He's given us power over all of the power of the enemy. And God will sustain us. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 and 19, in the latter portion of the verse, about midway down, listen to what the man of God said. He said, when the enemy, how many knows who the enemy is? I spent the last 15 minutes talking about your greatest enemy, the adversary, the devil, amen, that old serpent, amen, that great red dragon, that fallen anointed cherub, amen, and Isaiah said, amen, that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit, somebody, oh, glory to God, somebody say the spirit. When the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard, amen, against him. Woo! That phrase, shall raise up a standard or lift up a standard means to literally chase away. You see, he wins only if we fail. You see... When sin and men and sin and women come to the house of the Lord, the only way he wins is if they leave the premises not having found an order. Do you know there's a battle in the heavenlies right now over some of you sitting here? Absolutely. You know what it is? There are two powers. The power of light and good in which God uses his instrument his minister to try to reach out the hand of the Lord to, as the Bible would describe, to pull them out of the fire. And then you have, amen, the power of the dragon, the serpent that says, and the only thing that he can do, he cannot read your mind, but he can implant thoughts into your mind. he would say, well, lady, you're too young to go to church. Mister, your life is ahead of you. Why would you want to bound yourself down with a bunch of rules and regulations and dress codes and all of that sort of thing and be obligated to the house of the Lord when you can be out there having yourself a time? Huh? Is that... Is that not the way he talks to us? Not in an audible voice, but he speaks to the young. And then he'll jump up to the middle age. That's why there's no use for you going to church. Why, you've done waited too late. Is that not the way? He is a sly old fox. He knows how to talk to whatever generation he knows how to speak to the young, the middle-aged, and the elderly. He tells them what sounds good and fine to the flesh. You see, because the world has a lot to offer the young. Man is filled with pleasures. I mean, there's highs you can get on out there. Man, there's drugs out there and liquid beverages that you can drink. I mean, the world is just filled full of good times. And you're going to bound yourself down by a bunch of rules and regulations by a big mouth preacher that really don't know what he's talking about in no way. That's what the devil tells you. Why well, that's Ronnie Wolfer. <laughs> Why well, he used to live right on the holler. He don't know nothing. Well, Who does he think he is? That's the way that he knows how to talk to you. For Ezekiel said of him, Thou art wiser than Daniel. To the young, you've got, you've got the world before you. But then we teach in Sunday school this morning the parable, the ground of a certain rich man that brought forth plentiful. And how that he didn't know what to do with all of his goods. And began to think and say within himself, this is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And then after I get them built, 
and all of my fruit is stored up, I'm going to sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. There's the good times. Man, I'm going to have a man. I don't have to work no more. Got all the money I'll ever spend. I'm just going to party, party, party. Until the Lord said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And then whose shall these things be? You see, the devil is a liar. Has been from the beginning. I'm telling you, amen, that there is a war in the heavenlies, even in this place tonight, where the powers of good and the powers of evil reside together in clash over your very, very soul. You see, what will it be? Who will, I wonder tonight, who will be the victor? Who will be the victor? Heaven or hell? Who's going to win tonight in this struggle that is among us right now? Amen. He cannot win unless you fail. And the devil, he's counting on you. You see, he's a gambler. He don't know everything. He certainly don't. He can't read your mind. He don't know what you're going to do. And you know what hell's worried about right now? The devil's worried about you. I mean, when you came to church tonight, you got him worried. Huh? Any brother Charlie? When seeing a folk come to the house, house it worried him sometimes when some Christian folk come. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Please, Lord, don't let me get mean. I'm doing good tonight. <laughs> huh? I mean, when the Send the folk come to the house of the Lord. Man, see, the devil don't know what you're going to do. He's saying, man, what are they going to church for? Huh? I mean, what are they going up there for? I mean, they don't belong to church. They ain't got no business going to church. Huh? Well, there's other places you can go. You can go to bingo. I don't know, you can just sit on the yard and throw rocks and people go by. Huh? I mean, he ain't going to church. So, so when, when, when send the folk... Get ready, and they decide they're going to come to the church house. Man, the devil gets worried because he knows he's in for a battle. And you know what he does? Do you want to know how the devil got to church tonight? He rode with you. <laughs> he sure did. Huh? Well, he'll hop right on in and right, right on to church with you. You know why? Because one thing he ain't, he ain't afraid to fight. And he's up for the battle. You know why? Because there's something at stake. It is your very soul. Lord Jesus. What some people think. Uh, I don't mean who brought you to church with the devil. Right? See, the devil, you can't see. You can't feel it. And you can't touch him. You see, he's a spirit being. Huh? But he'll hop right along because he knows there's going to be a fight tonight. And he's going to be in the center of the ring. And your very soul is at stake. And the battle is going on. And until church is over and he can get you out of here unsaved, man, you've got him worried. He, he needs three Xanaxes and a dose of Prozac. Huh? I mean, just anything he can get to settle his nerves. Because you got him worried. <laughs> he's afraid. He's afraid the Lord's going to knock on your heart. And you're going to say, yes, Lord. And then he said, what am I going to do now? I failed. But the only way that he can win tonight is if you fail. And I'm not going to let him win. Not in my life for you. Hey man, I made up my mind a long time ago. I'm not going to let the devil win in my life. I'm going to go down fine with every breath of my body. I'm going to go down swinging. The devil is counting on you to fail. And you saints, the beloved of God, Paul refers to the church as beloved. And you are the beloved of God. 
Amen. You are the, you're special. Amen. You're the apple of his eye. And all at the same time, while the sinners has got him worried, he has to contend with the saints. Amen. Trying to kill, steal, and to destroy those people. But the Bible says in Isaiah 54 and 17, amen, in the first part of the verse, he says for us that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. See, God has promised us victory through him. Amen. Paul said, for I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Is that not what he said in Philippians 4, 13, I believe it is? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, he said. I don't have to worry about the devil. Amen. In this battle that I'm in. Amen. We know by Scripture that this is all around us. I'm telling you, if you could see what's going on around you right now, you'd fall out of your seat. Some might even would have a heart attack. It is so fearful of what is going on. And you understand what another dimension is, don't you? Another sphere. A place where spirits live. Not the dead, but those that are eternally alive. They exist and reside in the realm of of the invisible. You see, they're all around. When I get up to preach, the devil gets up with me. You just can't see him. When you get up to sing, when you stand to worship, the devil stands with you. When you're clapping your hands and stomping your feet, the devil is right there. What is he doing? Putting thoughts into your mind. He said, what? Well, in your business, clapping his hands for you. Ain't that what he does? I mean, then he say, you see that looking at you. Well, you'd never know if you hadn't been looking at that. That right? You already been fooled by the devil. I told you he's smarter than you. Smarter than me. Huh? Yeah. And there'd be somebody over on this side be mad at somebody on this side before church is over with. Because the devil done told him, they, they gave me a dirty look. Huh. You ever had anybody give you a dirty look? That's what the devil said. Well, well, they didn't smile. They didn't do nothing. They just looked at you kind of funny. I know they was thinking something bad. You see? And then you've already quit clapping your hands. You're balling up your fist at what you're doing behind the scenes. Well, I was outside, bless God, I'd show that sister. <laughs> See, devil got you fighting mad, and, and you still in the church out. Got the Holy Ghost in there, thank you. Well, ain't that true? Uh, I mean, just got through speaking in tongues, just first part of the service, now you ready to fight. <laughs> See, thou art, Ezekiel said, wiser than Daniel. He knows how to do his job. And without him, we are no match for the devil. That's right. Understand. And he's going to do everything to keep the lost lost and the backslidden backslid. And he's going to try everything that he can to cause God's people to fall and to fail. Because that's the only way that he can win. We know this, that the spirit realm exists because the Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, this phrase means angels that you cannot see that exist. Now, the Bible says, now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. That's Jesus Christ. In the book of Job, he was Elohim. He was God Almighty. Now, that was the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. 
that Satan came also among them. You see, Satan still has access to heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 12 how that he was cast into the earth. That's where we live. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered. There was a conversation going on between Satan and the Lord right in heaven. Satan came right on. Now, you know if he ain't afraid to go into heaven, he sure ain't afraid to come to church. Uh, if he ain't afraid to enter in heaven where Michael and Gabriel is, and Jesus Christ himself sitting on the throne, he's certainly not afraid to come to the Pentecostal tabernacle at Egerton, West Virginia or any other apostolic church. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Satan spent his time investigating the inhabitants of this planet and then going back to heaven to make accusation against the apple of God's eye. You see, he has already got the drunkard. He's already got the drug addict, the liar, the thief, and the robber. But what he's after is God's prized possession. That's his church, that blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. Now, listen what the conversation said. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Verse 8. And then the Lord asked him a question. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now, we know by that phrase that what was on Satan's mind was the servants of the Lord. Now, not necessarily Job at this particular point in time, and there was a reason for that. But the Lord wanted Satan to recognize that there was a man in the earth that loved the Lord more than he loved anything in the world. And his name was Job. And Job was the richest man of all these. He was a teacher of some sort. People sought his counsel from time to time. He had servants. He had cattle. He had oxen. He had camels and asses. He had ten children. And Job was a mighty man in the land, but he was a lover of God. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and assureth evil. Now watch in verse 9, his reply. Satan said, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doeth Job fear God for naught? Verse 10. Watch this. And the devil looks at the Lord. He says, I'm going to tell you why Job serves you. It's because all the money you put in his pocket. I'll tell you why Job serves you. It's because you gave him wisdom to be able to give counsel. You made him prestigious in the area. You have made him rich and famous. And everybody in the Middle East has heard of Job. That's why Job served you, Mr. Lord. You want to brag on him? That's why I'm telling you why Job's serving you. Hast thou, hast not thou made an hedge about him? How many knows what a hedge is? Sometimes you see these green plants called hedges that that a box in someone's home. 
And that's what he's talking about, a protective shield. And Satan's saying you put a protective shield about him. And about his house. And about all that it hath and ten heathen kids of his. You got a hedge about them too. Is that what he says? About all that he hath on every side, north, south, east, and west. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. I'm paraphrasing the rest of that little story. I want to tell you something. The Lord knows everything. Satan does not. Job made this, this statement of this situation in his life. I want you to understand that although there's a protective shield around you, sometimes the hedge comes down. And there is a particular reason for that. You see, Satan has already boasted in heaven to all of heaven, to Michael and Gabriel and the innumerable company of angels that have surrounded the throne of God. Say, hey, look. The Lord has said and questioned to me about this man, Job. But I'll tell you why he serves God. Because God has made him rich. God has increased everything that he has. God has got a hedge about him. That's why. And the Lord said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, everything that he has is in your hand. Save his life only. I'm going to allow you to touch everything that he has, but he himself, you can't touch him. You see, this is where Satan is going to be made a fool of. Satan don't know everything. He didn't know what Job was going to do. He didn't know how Job was going to react. No more that when the sin of man and the sin of woman come to the house of God, he's worried because he don't know what you're going to do. Are you going to get out of that seat and come to this altar? Or are you going to get out of this seat and find the back door? Until you make that decision, and more than that, make that move, the devil don't know what you're going to do. What you're going to do, you got him worried to death. He assumed the only reason Job was serving him was because of the riches that he had. And I'll tell you tonight, if the only reason we serve God is because he can heal us, we're serving him for the wrong reason. Or for the way that he can make for us, or the money that he can put in our pockets, we are serving him for the wrong reason. We serve him because we love him. We give our life to him because he gave his life for us. That's why we serve him. That's why true men and women of God can serve him with a job or without a job, with a house or without a house, with an automobile or without an automobile. A true man or woman of God can serve him in sickness and in health. Is that not true? Is that not what God expects? He expects us to serve him in sickness and in health. Amen. When you get hooked up with him, it's for richer or for poorer. I would imagine in the secular world, there have been countless divorces just because of the lack of money in the home. Just because perhaps the husband got out of work, lost the house, and lost the car, and mama can not shop no more. Uh, she decides she would get her somebody else. I guarantee you, there's a lot of divorces for that reason. But when, when you hook up in matrimony, it's for richer or poor. It's in sickness and in health. No matter how sick I get, Gladys is obligated to take care of me to the day I die. That not true? And me the same with her. Amen. That's the way it is with God. No matter what condition that I am in, 
Amen. I am his till the day I die. In sickness and in health, for richer or for poor, if I have a lot or if I don't have anything, I am his and he is mine. And that the world cannot take away from me. I feel the Holy Ghost better. I'll tell you one thing. You can look at what I got and know that I don't serve him for what I have. Ain't that the truth? Huh? That's right. I mean, I'll never have to worry about the devil going to heaven and say, I know why Ronnie Wolf would serve me. Huh? It's all that money he's got. <laughs> I like to know where it's at. I know. But it wouldn't matter if I had a million dollars in the bank or ten million. Or Donald Trump's ten billion. Amen. I still love the Lord. It doesn't matter. Amen. When I come to him, it's his sickness and his health for rich and for poor until the day that I die. See, when you take up with him, you got it in for the day. Huh? You may quit. You may walk away. You know, I said, this is till death. Come on. Till death, do your part. Until the day that God calls me out of here, this body expires. Amen. I'm to stay with Him. When God called me, saved me, sanctified me, filled me with the Holy Ghost, then I'm to stay with Him till the day that I die. And then if I do, amen, I'm going to have things, amen, that I can't even imagine in my mind. But Satan said, that's why. You see, but Satan didn't know. He was blessed. That's what he was doing. And God called his blood. You see, and he said, there, take away everything that has. You know the story. And Satan took his substance. He took his wealth. And he took his ten children. And this was Job's response. And I know we preached on it a hundred times, I guess. More than that, I guess. But we need to understand if we're the apple of his eye, sometimes the hedge is going to come down. We're going to get sick from time to time. We're going to be afflicted from time to time. We're going to be without from time to time. Sometimes it's just God going to find out to let you know what's in your heart. Is that the truth? Job had this much confidence in God. In this particular happening of his life, Job said in Job chapter 23 and verse 10, He knoweth the way that I take. Ain't that wonderful? He knows no matter what befalls me. He knows the way that I'm going to take it. The devil don't know that. But Job said, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job had his mind made up. Job didn't serve God for his cattle. He didn't serve God for his camel, nor his lambs. Or nothing of that matter. He didn't even serve God for his children. He served God for himself. And he said, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Uh, because he wasn't about to let the devil win. Uh -uh. The only way the devil could win in Job's life was if Job were to fail. Satan said God to God, take everything that he hath. And he'll curse you to your face. That's what Satan said. You take away his riches, and he'll curse you to your face. But the Lord knew better. And when messenger after messenger after messenger had come with the bad news, and finally the loss of his ten children, this is what Job had to say in Job chapter 1 and verse 20. Then, see now, all in the meantime, this war was going on. 
in the heavenly. See, Job couldn't see it. Job never seen the first angel. He never heard the first supernatural voice. He didn't know anything about anything that was going on, only that he knew the God that he trusted in was able to keep him. And that's all that we need to know is to know that our God is able to keep us. And he knew that, and he believed that with all of his heart, mind, and soul. Yes, he did. And he stood upon that. And messenger after messenger after messenger came to him. And then when it was all said and done, and he woke up one morning, a rich man, and the next morning, a poor man. Then Job arose and rent his mantle. That was a sign of suffering and shame. It was a sign that he was a man now, not rich, not famous, but a man afflicted. And he would pour ashes on top of his head. Then Job arose and ran his mantle and he shaved his head, a sign of shame. And fell down upon the ground and worshipped. That's what he did. If we could just understand that no matter what the situation is, if we're physically evil in our bodies, in our minds and spirit, amen, just, just worship. And Job, your cattle is gone. The Sabaeans just fell upon them. And Job just fell down on the ground. Knowing that there was nothing that he could do about it. He said, verse 21 Naked, now all at the same time, Lucifer is right there, Johnny on the spot, seeing what he's going to do. Now I guarantee you there's a devil somewhere in this church. I'm going to say there's a few of them. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm talking about in the spiritual realm. If you could really see, the church would be full tonight. Because in every vacant seat is a spirit. Does that sound wild? Does that sound like the twilight zone? You ain't sitting on a seat by yourself. You've got all kinds. I'm telling you, it's real. You better believe it. They are there. You can't see them. You can't touch them. You can't smell them. You can't hear them. But they are there. Trying to kill, steal, and destroy the apple of God. He don't want you to worship. They don't want you to praise. They don't want you to give a testimony. But listen to what Job said. Satan right there, listening to every word that Job would speak. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. He knew that everything that he had came. It belongs. If it comes from God, it belongs to God. When you were born, you were born naked. You brought nothing into this world. And for sure, the Bible says, you can carry nothing out. That's why fools lay up treasures on earth. He said, naked came out from my mother's womb. In other words, I'm no worse off than I was when I was born. And naked shall I return thither. No matter how much I have, I can't take it with me. The Lord is sick. Now, he'd just been to ten funerals. Can you imagine? 
He just buried ten children. But he said even his children didn't belong to him. They belong to the Lord. The Lord gave, he said. I'm telling you, he shot hell with his testimony. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed. You remember what Job said? If you take what he has, he'll curse you to your face. Job did. God knew what Job would do. And instead of cursing, he began to bless. You ought to try it sometime. <laughs> you ought to try it sometime. Blessing, I mean, instead of cussing sometimes. I need to cuss sometimes. I'm not going to get this stuff now. If I ain't going to hammer or something, or bump your head and get a cabinet, you better say, oh, bless the Lord. That's what you better say. Uh, should I go and say, you can translate that any way you want. You know, I'm telling you the truth. You bump your head and say, thank you, Jesus. It wasn't no worse than what it is. Part of the blessings in my life. Glory to God. And you, you, know what, you know what I'm talking about. You bump your head and you just... Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return to the Lord and gave that the Lord and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, he said. And that just sent shivers and shivers up Satan's spine at me. Listen to what verse 22 says as a single big one. In all this, the loss of his oxen, the loss of his sheep, the loss of his asses, the loss of of his ten children. In all this, Job sinned not. And that wasn't all the scripture said. Nor charged God foolishly. Man, I'm sure that he was hurt. More than anything, over the loss of his children. There's no doubt in my mind because Job would even sacrifice for his children. I wish we could do that today. I've got two heathen children that certainly need sacrifice for. Because they ain't in the house of the Lord sacrificing for themselves. But I could sacrifice for them all day long and it won't help them none. See, this is a personal thing. Mama can't save you and the world can't send you to hell. The only way the devil wins is if you fail. Always remember that. The only way that the devil can win is if we fail. And we need to have the same attitude, same spirit that Job had. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. What the devil didn't know. The devil even used Job's wife against him. Because there was another day when Satan came and presented himself before the Lord. And the Lord asked him again, said, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him in all the earth? Satan come up with another big lie. He said, Yeah. Skin for skin. Will a man give to save his life? Allow me to flick him, his own person, his own body. Let me make it personal. He didn't backslide because his wife said to curse God and die. He didn't backslide because his children are dead. But you let me touch his flesh, and he'll surely curse you to your face. And Satan left the presence of the Lord with the approval from God, touched his body, and he afflicted Job with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. In all of that, Job sinned not. 
Not only was Job willing to suffer lost, suffer affliction, but he was willing to give his life also. Job 13 and 15. Job cried out in the midst of his affliction, in the midst of his desperation, in the midst of his sickness. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I want to tell you tonight, you don't have anybody else to trust in. There's nobody else that can help you but the God of old glory. The one that holds the very beat of your heart in the palm of his hand. The very breath of your life. He holds. No matter your sickness, no matter your disease, no matter your affliction, there's no but one that can help you. Mr. God of Job. Emmanuel. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And until he does, until the day of my death, I will maintain my own ways before him. When I'm able, I'm going to church. When I'm able, I'm going to praise him. When I'm able, I'm going to pray. When I'm able, I'm going to read my Bible. I may be afflicted in this body, and what I can do may be less and less day by day. But as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to look into Jesus, the author, and finish up my faith. I heard somebody say earlier about miracles. I'm telling you, he's still the miracle working man from Galilee. There's been many that he's brought back from the doorway of death. Because like Job, they refuse to fail. They refuse to fail. And they walk as long as they had power to walk. And when they no longer had power to walk, they crawled as long as they had power to crawl. And when they had no more power to crawl, then they laid flat on the back and lift up their voice. Praising God. Praising God. I've seen several go out into eternity. Afflicted in bodies. Never able to return to the house of the Lord. But lay flat on their back. Away from their hands and speaking in tongues. Under the power of Almighty God. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you. You may be afflicted in body. You may be down and out. You may be at death's doorway. You may be at the bottom of the valley. But Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you always, even unto the end of the world. My trust is in Him. My hope is in Him. The Bible says, Abraham... Against hope, believed in hope. And God brought it to pass. And that's the attitude that we must have. The devil is counting on you tonight. Some of you sitting here, he's counting on you. Getting up and walking out. He's counting on you going that way. Instead of this way, he's counting on you. He don't know exactly what you're going to do, though. I mean, he's right by your side tonight. And he's wondering, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? And he's nervous. And he's biting his nails. Until he sees you rise. And you go that way. You go north. When you should have went south. East. When you should have went west. And then he begins to rejoice. I've won, I've won. Because every day that you're outside the door of the house of God, there's a chance that your life will be snuffed out. 
There's a change on your way home tonight that you'll meet death around dead men's curve. Never to be able to walk into the house of God again. And if that happens, there'll be a party in hell. They'll be rejoicing in that realm and that dimension of the unholy. And in hell, you will lift your eyes, having a change to win that you lost. It's up to you. What will it be? As she sings eternity. I want you to think about this just for a minute. What will it be? Who's going to win? Will it be you? Or will it be him?